Lord. Amy has been a blessing for all of us in so many ways, and now she needs uh, our support, and here we are. And we'd like to lift her up. We'd like to ask your angels to attend to her, and also to bless uh, the medical personnel when they come here to help in the best way possible. Uh, we ask the Lord, uh, with your healing hand, to be over her, to bless uh, uh, her family, to bless them, to not worry too much now. And Lord, uh, would you please uh, help us, despite of uh, the difficulties, to have the experience of uh, the early church when they have uh, had people that they prayed for, you have attended to them and blessed them. Bless also the squad, I hear them coming and bless them with the divine wisdom uh, to help them in the best way possible. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
God will press upon the ministries of our church. We're a global world church. We're not just like this church down there that has one thing. We're helping little churches, big churches, ministries all over. And we believe that this is the gospel to go out to all the world. So as we see our brothers and sisters, remember they are our brothers and sisters. And so we pray today, and especially pray for sisters, and Carl's and Amy, and that's I tell you what, they're wonderful people, and I'm going to be thinking about them all day long today. We we'll also pray for our, our worship service, and that Dave Wagley is going to speak with us, and we need to pray them. I've known him a long time, respect what he has to bring to the table, and so I hope that we'll, we'll glean from this and feel confident about the direction that we're going in this world. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and uh, the grace of us are singing songs and playing songs about you. We come here and we worship, even before we even sit down in the chair. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. There are all kinds of politics in the world and in the government. There's politics in the church. There's politics in Christianity. But maybe rise above that, that foolishness, the vain traditions of man, and go to the level where the Spirit of God is directing each one of us in a kind and concerned way with the fruits of the Spirit that we are giving of our hearts and minds to make the right choices. And as we make those right choices, may it be seen that they will know we are Christians by our love. Finally, we ask and that uh, this day is in your hands that all the efforts that we do and say will bring, bring more and more people to a better understanding of what your program is all about. That's it. Church, 
And uh, we have a granddaughter having, having a, a third birthday. So she would love to be with you, which, you know, it's, you know, they be with you and, you know, be on the road traveling or be up with the sun and your grandchildren, you know, they have way every time. Um, you know, we can't, uh, we, we can't get through this service with what we've just impacted, uh, been impacted by the, the significance of a loved one, a friend who has uh, had some complications this morning. And so I'm going to change my worship hour thought for not really worship hour, worship 20 minute thought that uh, I just want to share with you today uh, relative to how we're impacted. You know, we in, when we came in this morning, uh, none expected what we really went through, and especially the, their sister who had to be taken out uh, by EMT. And so I think we need to break for just a moment and pause and, and, and look at scripture um, for how God impacts these kind of things where we're impacted. And um, I want to take you to the Gospel of Mark. And in the Gospel of Mark, there's four pivotal stories that I want to go through in the, the minutes I have here today with you. And, and thank you, Pastor, for the warm uh, welcome, and thank you for the invitation to preach here. Uh, in light of what's happening this afternoon, I let Elder Attica know that I'd be at the Ohio Conference uh, today, and rather than hanging out where I hang out a lot at some Kettering. We had a bunch of meetings this week, a number of uh, meetings relative to the entities there in Kettering. And I said, uh, maybe I can visit a church. And uh, he got the word out, and your pastor said, hey, come preach. I said, sure, I'll be here at 11 o'clock. No, we, we have two services. Oh, OK, I'll be there at 9 o'clock. So actually, I left my hotel in Kettering about uh, 5.30 this morning just to make sure I was on time. There are four stories. Mark chapter 4, you're going to find uh, the beginning of the four stories and narratives I want to just acquaint ourselves with here. Um, Mark chapter 4, it is the first story, Jesus is in the boat. He has been working hard all day, and if you read the context, he's been teaching and preaching, and, and finally he comes at the end of the day, and the, the, the verse says like this, Mark chapter 4, and verse um, 35, it says, On the same day when evening has come, had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. And when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. Those little words, as he was, three little words, are significant. How was he? He was tired. His humanity was fatigued. He had been working all day long. If any of us work in any sort of a work that deals with people, teaching or medicine or anything you're dealing with, when you're dealing with people and the complex issues that people have, you get tired. You get worn out. Jesus' humanity was tired. The Bible says they took him as he was. And we know the rest of the story. He gets in the boat and what happens? He falls asleep. He isn't there but a few moments. And uh, it's a small little fishing boat. And he soon finds some, maybe some nets, some dried out nets lying there, and he soon finds a couple place, and it's the evening time, the, sa the sails go up, the disciples push away from the shore, they're going to the other side because the other, the other side represents asylum, it represents refuge, and getting away from the press of people. He is going over to the other side to relax. And he is in the boat for a little, a little bit of time, and soon he is asleep. The Bible says, um, as they begin to cross the lake, suddenly something happens. Um, verse 37. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat in the boat, so that it was already filling. In other words, the water was getting in the boat, the boat was filling up, and soon that little boat would sink. They were in the midst of a sudden storm. Nothing could warn them. Uh, you know, it just came very quickly. It came without notice. Uh, why? Because down there in the Sea of Galilee, literally down, the Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake in all the world. A little trivia, it's 330 feet below sea level. The, 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 the situation is you have the, the plain of Estrelon, the plain of Megiddo, that's the plain between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Sea in the Bible. 
and, and, and the cool air moves across the plain of the Gecko from the Great Sea, and it hits that warm, moist air of that lower lake, and immediately storms out. This happened that evening as the cycle would cross over. It probably was nighttime now, so you know, 8, 10, 12 miles across the lake, I mean, 11 miles in some places. And so they had a little journey to make, and as they're crossing the lake in the middle of the night, this sudden storm comes up without any warning. Soon, the sails are being torn this way and that way. They probably drop the sails, other boats with them, and then the water's starting to crash in the boat. Obviously, the sea becomes very, very uh, rough, and the water's coming into the boat, and, and the disciples sense and believe that they actually are going to perish. And they're crying out, help and the lightning flashes. One narrative reads and says, they see Jesus asleep. Man, how can he be asleep? There he is asleep. You know, when you think about the suddenness of storm, life, this story is, is really given to us because it helps us understand life sometimes. We are the people in the boat going through life. And things are just going along normal, it seems, and all of a sudden, suddenly, without warning, you're impacted by some misfortune. And it could be a disease, it could be a disaster. Think about the people, the tornadoes, the earthquakes, tsunamis. It could be a death. I mean, these things come without any kind of warning. And, 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 and like the disciples, we get anxious. We begin to fear. We begin to wonder, what's going on? Who's in charge here? Why is this happening? And all kinds of questions into our minds. And the closer you are to the issue, the closer you are to the person dealing with that, the more you're impacted. Here, here are the disciples, we, we, the, the scripture does not really bring out in this passage the anxiety that they are sensing, but they believe they are going to perish. As you read further in there, you understand it better. But, they see Jesus. The Bible says in verse 38, he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. They woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are what? What's your Bible say? Do you not care that we are perishing? That we're dying? We're going through a very, very difficult situation. Who, what, do you not care? And notice what the Lord says. He doesn't answer them directly, but he immediately takes in the situation. Of course, his divinity saw it all, but his humanity, he was restricted to at that moment. He was sleeping, and he arose, the Bible says in verse 39, rebuked, rebuked the wind. We don't know what he said to the wind. The prince of the power of the air is the devil. He didn't, we don't know what he says to him, but he rebukes the wind and says to the sea, all oh, those famous words, peace, be still. In the midst of our storm, who are going through our trial and our difficult situation, and we're crying out, God, don't you care? He doesn't directly say to us maybe what we're dealing with. He simply says to our heart, peace, be still. And then in this story, he turns to the disciples and he says, some very interesting words. It, 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 to me, it's a, 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 a puzzle, it's a quandary. He turns to the disciples and he says to them, why, verse 40, why are you so fearful? How is it that you don't have any faith? Wait, 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 this seems unfair. Wait a minute. If you or I were on that boat, in that boat, water's coming in and we are sinking, we are going to be anxious. If we are in the midst of a trial, a difficult time dealing with disease or whatever it might be, we are anxious. Jesus turns to us and says, why are you so afraid? How is it that you have no faith? Wait a minute, Lord, don't you understand I mean, how we think and how we process? This is an unfair question. But the issue here was not does the Lord understand who we are and how we're made? The issue here is much greater. Because the next response, when Jesus says to them, what's wrong, why are you so afraid? Their response back to him is not an answer. You don't find direct answers to any of the four questions in this passage, in this narrative. Rather, you find another question. 
And the Bible says, you see the very last verse, uh, it says, uh, they feared exceedingly, verse 41, and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey his voice? The issue is not did he understand them, but did they understand who he was and is. In life, as we're going through life, we somehow in our humanity forget who is with us in the boat? Who is with us? And, 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 and if you had some sort of a fear monitor, you could somehow attach something to a person, you could, you could test and see how much fear they're feeling. When they were going down, they were afraid, right? The Bible says they were fearful. Jesus said, why are you so fearful? But then look at the last verse. The Bible says now, they fear exceedingly. <laughs> what were they before? Were they not afraid when they were going to perish in the boat? Now the Bible says they even feared more. So the monitor went from maybe a, if it's a zero to ten, ten being the highest, and it was maybe an eight or nine when they were going to, you know, uh, drown in the boat or go down in the sea. Now all of a sudden they fear exceedingly. Now it's going off the charts. They're more fearful with who is with them because all of a sudden they realize somebody is with us who is so powerful he can speak and the wind sees blowing and the sea becomes calm. Wow! Who is this? And that's the point of the story. Who's in life with us? Who is with us? I mean, you go through this whole little narrative uh, chapters and you'll find one narrative after another in the Gospel of Mark here. In fact, it is a as we say in say literature, it's a recurring motif. It keeps coming through. It's the thread that takes you through the gospel, the book of Mark I'm talking about. And the big question here is, is who is this guy? Forgive me for using such a human term as guy, but who is this? Who is this with us? You go to the very next narrative, next story, and you find Jesus steps away from the storm on the sea and he meets a storm in humanity. And this, this, this book of Mark says there was, a, there was one, uh, there was actually two, according to Matthew, but uh, two guys possessed of a demon. And, and, and they come running to, to, to Jesus, disciples getting out of the boat. And you find here they're, they, they, they are, they're running towards him, and uh, the Bible says they're cutting and hurting themselves, harming themselves. And they come in verse uh, 6. Chapter 5, verse 6 of Mark, when he saw Jesus, this is the one person, he ran and worshipped him. He cried out with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you, he says, uh, that you not tor torment me. Jesus says, Come out. I'm the man, I'm the Holy Spirit. What is your name? My name is Legion. Jesus casts him out, puts him into pigs. You know the story, runs down in the ocean or the sea, and the pigs perish. And all of a sudden, the man is restored. And then the people who are watching over the, the thousands of pigs run back to the owners of the village and tell the people what happened. And the, and the, and the herdsmen, uh, you know, bring back the townspeople and the owners, and they meet Jesus. And now we're back, we're up here in, in, in verse 15. They came to Jesus, uh, chapter 5, verse 15. They saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them what had happened. And, and to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. And the Bible says they began to plead with Jesus to leave. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know who he was. And so Jesus leaves. Christ will not impose himself on anyone. That's why a painter has done it right when he has Jesus at the door knocking on the door. There's no door handle on the outside, is there? You've got to open from the inside. He does not push himself on. So he leaves. And he gets back in the boat. He goes back across the water. He comes to the other side. And here's the second, third story. And you find Jarius meeting him there and saying, Will you please come? My little girl is about ready to die. She's very sick. So Jesus starts making his way to Jarius' house. And on the way, he has the third story we're talking about. The third incident happened. 
On the way, there's a lady who's been sick for many years, 12 years, and she's trying to, trying to find healing, trying to be healed, trying to deal with this. And she's actually been to see Jesus before, but she's, she's so weak she can't push to the crowd. And again, it looks like this time she'll miss her, her moment with Christ because the crowd is pushing her back. But Jesus comes close enough where she can do what? Touch him. And I can see her getting down on her knees and reaching through the legs of the people until she reaches out and touches Christ's garment. And Jesus turns to, to those around him and says, what? Who touched me? And the disciples say, it's Peter. Who are you touching? Everybody is touching you. He didn't know he was. Immediately the lady is healed. She's restored. Christ brings her forth. She says, make sure she understands it wasn't magic. It's her faith reaching out to the Savior who changed her life. He didn't understand who he was. <clears throat> See, we can come to church, we can sit in the pew, we can have a nominal faith, but it's those who reach out with their heart of faith who receive the blessing. Recognizing the power of God. We go to our last story. Jesus comes into Jairus, a little girl. And they tell him before he gets there, as he approaches that little house, and the crowd is already gathered, they tell him, don't worry, the little girl has perished. She's died. They don't, they, you can't help. And Jesus says, no, she's not, she's not dead. She's simply sleeping. They say, oh, no, you're crazy. And they laugh at him. But he excuses everybody. Takes the mother and father, <clears throat> Peter, James, and John, goes in. He does the rest of the story. He says, the little girl, arise, and heals her. They did not know who he was. You go through the whole book of Mark. These stories are, are not just put there to entertain us. They're there to help us to identify our life with some of these situations and understand how we in life do not realize how he can impact life and who he is. Now, it is interesting in this passage, if you stay tight to the context, you'll find this theme running through. Who is he? There, there are individuals who know who he is. In fact, go with me back to the passage there in chapter 5. And verse 7, when the man came to worship Christ, the demon-possessed man, he cried with a loud voice, and the demon spoke through him and said this, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? If you go back to Mark chapter 3, you will find in Mark chapter 3 another passage and you'll find in verse 10, Mark chapter 3 and 10, he healed many, so that as many as had affliction and passed and pressed, to be pressed about him to touch him. <clears throat> verse 11, and the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. I guess Christ didn't want the demons being his PR people around broadcasting who he was. But, but, the, but, they, but the demons understood who he is and who he was. Why? Well, if you understand the great controversy as taught and believed in the book of Ezekiel and also Revelation chapter 12, we know that the demons are not, as the world may teach, departed loved ones, spirits floating around, but rather they are fallen angels, angels who once were in the great theater of heaven, worshiping before Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. They worshiped and honored him. So there was something they could sense about him of who he was. And so when he, got, when he landed here on this world, they recognized this is none other than one of the God here. This is the Son of God, the great creator, the most powerful being in all the universe. They knew who he was. Or the humans could figure it out. Yet, <clears throat> the book of Mark has an interesting 
interesting little footnote. If you go to the very, very, very first chapter, the very first, the first verse, it tells us, and bookends us, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, what? Son of God. And then you journey all through this book. It's a wonderful study. You go all through this book and you find this question coming up. Who is he? Who is he? And all these stories illustrating the, the, the great question that humans have about Jesus Christ. But then you come to the final chapters and you find there is one human that gets it right. And that is at the cross. And you find the century. This is Mark chapter 15. And... Um, You'll find the centurion, excuse me, verse 39. When the centurion looked up and saw Jesus hanging upon the cross and dying upon the cross, he already been through a lot of the drama of the cross. The centurion says these words. It's almost as if he's answering the question that has been posed in the book of Mark. Who is he? The centurion says, truly, this man is the son of God. Something about Jesus dying, the way he died, told humans and informed humans of who he is, who he was. The point that I want to bring out of all these stories this morning is that, you know, the Lord, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. And if he is with us, if he's with us in our anxious moments of life, we have nothing to fear. He's on the throne. I was flying from Atlanta to Oakland, California on my way to Hong Kong as a, as a student missionary type in college a few years ago. Sitting across the aisle from me was a young lady who had been visiting on the airplane all the way across the country. And um, as we landed, just as the wheels, you know, the most nervous moments with anybody who flies is when you take off when you land. It's when you're all a little sweaty. Like, well, you know, let's get through this. When you're up in the sky, you know, you got whatever's happening around you and you're kind of relaxed, sleeping, whatever. That's those landing, take off the landings. As the plane came down, the wheels, <clears throat> just as they touched the tarmac, the plane sort of heaved and twisted a little bit. It, it didn't feel like for just a moment. Things went all right, but that, that we were going to have an incident, that something was not going to go right. And for that split second, you hear this gasp through the cabin. <gasps> and just that quickly, the plane straightened out. And I turned to the girl next to me and I said, Boy, that was close. And she said, ah, I wasn't worried. I said, Oh, you were worried? Yeah, I wasn't worried. I said, uh, You must fly a lot. Well, yeah, but that's not the reason. I said, why? I mean, if you heard the cabin, you know, it's kind of for a moment felt a little tense and it felt like something wasn't right. She said, yeah, but I, I don't worry about that. I said, well, why? She said, well, I know the pilot. I said, really? Yeah, she says, he's my father. I have nothing to fear. You know, that's the way it is with Jesus. We go through these tough times. We know the father. We know he's in charge. He's with us, we have nothing to fear.
you. The, the day after the second service, we're going to have pop up. And I do hope uh, Elder Wagner can join us. So you'll have the time to meet him and talk uh, with him. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, Elder Wiley for changing his topic. You realize that he preached just out of uh, the Bible on Holds uh, to us to accommodate what um, we experienced this morning. And I will let uh, uh, Amy and uh, Carlos Dennis know about that and to we'll give them also the recording to hear your concern. So, uh, Elder Wiley, please. Gentlemen, before you pray, I got a text. But Amy, she's doing okay. Yeah. Charlie has slow went down with it and said to tell the congregation she appreciates everyone. She's still weak, but she's okay. So I'm not waiting. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you're on the throne. That no matter what happens in this world, that um, you're part of it, part of our lives. And thank you, Lord, that you're in the boat with us that um, we have nothing to fear, for you are God and you are here. Bless us now, we pray in Christ's name. Because we have a few minutes to go, and we're not the kind of people to just leave, the band's going to play, and you're getting orders from the staff and administration that you need to shake hands and greet at least two people that shouldn't come up today. So when the band plays, we go about our duties. One, two, three, four. <laughs>